afternoon and thank you very much to the organizers for this fascinating conference. Um, you already presented us, so I'm starting right off. Um, we are working on this project together that is called Humanitarian Action and Translation, and it brings together, in fact, translation studies and history um, to investigate the strategic use of language within Switzerland's wartime humanitarian operations. Our PowerPoint today shows some photos of a child evacuation that we will discuss shortly. So during the Second World War, um, Switzerland was a neutral country, neutral country with a long history of humanitarianism and conveniently located at the very center of warring Europe. Importantly, humanitarian help given to countries such as Italy, France and Belgium um, was both enabled and facilitated by Swiss multilingualism. The ability of Swiss politicians and Swiss humanitarian aid workers to communicate with the governments of the belligerent countries, but also with those affected by war, was a considerable advantage when negotiating the politics around the provision of humanitarian aid and in the day-to-day -day running of the projects. Although we all know that humanitarian aid became politicized in various wartime contexts, this politicization stands out, stands out or stands in stark contrast with Swiss neutrality. You would think that Switzerland's global reputation as a neutral nation would extend to also offer protection and immunity to its humanitarian projects. However, in this case, this did not happen. In fact, this paper will carefully explore a unique Swiss-led child evacuation scheme to show that when this humanitarian aid became politicized and possibly detrimental to Switzerland's image abroad, the Swiss quickly turned to translation to counteract the issue. So Swiss multilingualism and translation were innovative mechanisms to not only protect humanitarian projects, but also by extension, Switzerland's image and its neutrality. And I pass on to my colleague. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, so yes, as Lisa said, uh, today's case study explores a very surprisingly successful and enormous transnational evacuation of 60,000 French, Belgian and Serbian children to Switzerland. This evacuation began in November 1940 when a coalition of 17 Swiss charities, which had operated similar evacuations during the Spanish Civil War, decided to focus their efforts on, on occupied southern Vichy France. From 1940 to 1942, the Swiss coalition chose children based on their health, which was rather unusual given other domestic evacuations in, say, Britain and Germany. Local Red Cross doctors chose children from ages four to 14 years old who were indigent, sickly, and malnourished. And then they were sent on one convoy per week to Geneva. By early 1941, the Swiss charities were the very, very first to access German-occupied Belgium, where they selected children for evacuation to Switzerland with explicit German consent. It's important to note three unique things about this evacuation. First, the selection of children from Western Europe is very deliberate. It was raised that perhaps Polish children should be included, but Swiss charities were worried that the success between the host and evacuee was dependent on an ability to communicate. Therefore, only children who were culturally and linguistically compatible with Switzerland were brought to Switzerland. As a result, French-speaking children were given preference for evacuation to French-speaking Switzerland. In the case of Flemish-speaking Belgians, they were then sent to German-speaking Switzerland. We also know that this policy around language made hosting foreign children more attractive to host because they were considered foreign, but not too foreign in a language or culture for the average Swiss family. The second feature of this evacuation is that they were entirely funded by Swiss people. An enormous propaganda campaign was launched and citizens donated in various ways. Host families got extra rations, but donated their monies toward meeting the costs of hosting the child, of course. And then businesses such as Migros raised prices of certain goods and then donated revenues. Millions of Swiss francs were raised and everyone in Switzerland knew about these evacuations. 
And then finally, the third feature is that it was only for three month periods. The, this was to prevent child evacuees from becoming a permanent family or national burden. Preference was always given to host children with Swiss parentage or Swiss relations. And the return of children back to France and Belgium and Serbia was regulated by the Swiss federal immigration authorities. And therefore, the strict three month duration standardized the evacuations and protected Switzerland from becoming a permanent refuge for European children. With all these parameters, the popularity of these evacuations was unsurpassed. Thousands of Swiss families offered spots for French children. Over 2,000 were offered in Geneva alone. And by December of 1941, Switzerland had hosted more than 7,000 children, the majority of whom were French. But we begin to see some problems in late 1941. The overwhelming costs, the wartime transportation difficulties, the growing scope of the involved nations, these were insurmountable challenges. And as a result, it was decided that these Swiss charities would be absorbed into a larger joint venture between the Swiss Red Cross and the Swiss government. The government's intervention was deemed the only solution because it was the only body that could raise sufficient funds and resources to successfully carry out these evacuations. So let's stop here for one second. Why would Switzerland invite foreign children for three month stays in the midst of war? And there's two key reasons. First is Swiss human humanitarianism and the other one is Swiss neutrality. So first, as we mentioned, Switzerland's humanitarian tradition is deeply ingrained, was deeply ingrained in the fabric of Swiss society, founding the Red Cross, creating international laws for governments at war, and ultimately standardizing hum humanitarian practices globally. The Swiss people were acutely aware that their French neighbors were threatened by German aggression and humanitarian intervention for vulnerable children was one method to help their neighbors. From a practical standpoint, the charity's previous experiences from the Spanish Civil War, as we mentioned, helped to establish the infrastructure of such an operation. And there's loads to unpack here too about children's rights growing in the interwar period, but we don't have time for that today. Secondly, Switzerland's neutrality was and remains a long held political position that made it immune from the very politically treacherous waters of continental Europe. However, this neutrality is self-mandated and often a convenient excuse to avoid taking a position against belligerent actions. We must also remember that this neutrality was supported by Switzerland's unique multilingualism. In that sense, Switzerland's ability to broker trade deals and conduct diplomacy is even more heightened. And historians argue relentlessly about whether Switzerland was always under threat of invasion from the Axis. But others argued that Switzerland was too valuable as a trading center to both Axis and allied nations. And of course, the International Committee of the Red Cross offered a significant cost saving service to all belligerents at war. So there's a lot to unpack here as well, as well around financial agreements and say the value of uh, the Swiss franc in, in international markets at the time, but we don't have enough time for that. So, but whether or not you agree that Switzerland was under invasion, threat of invasion or not, the key thing here is that Switzerland's neutrality, facilitated by its multilingualism, was even more important than its humanitarianism or its financial trading as the critical factor in ensuring its own self-preservation. So let's go back to the story in this child evacuation. 1942 comes on the 1st of January, the Swiss Red Cross and the Swiss government join forces to operate this enormous child evacuation, which I will now call Kinderhilfe or children's relief. All previous policies, budgets, employees were transformed to create a new streamlined organization, which was critically controlled by the Swiss government. This created tension, as you can imagine, between the charitable actions of the Swiss Red Cross and the political demands of the Swiss federal government. To oversee this new Kinderhilfe, we got Swiss federal councillor Marcel Pelegola appointed Edward de Halle as a guide, even as a political inspiration to the Swiss Red Cross. Although de Halle had worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross, he operated mostly as an informant for Pelegola, 
Meanwhile, de Halle's brother-in-law was Pierre Bona. He's conveniently head of the Foreign Affairs Division of the Federal Political Department. So Bona was politically astute, he's manipulative, and he's concerned about keeping Germany and Italy on side by suggesting that the evacuation, evacuation should benefit Axis children rather than destitute children under Axis occupation. So those are all three of the government officials that we'll talk about today. But then on the other side, we have the Swiss Red Cross, a guy named Colonel Raymond, who's the president of the Kinderhelfer. But as far as we can tell from the documents and the, the history, he has far less power than his counterparts in the Swiss government. So on the surface, this new merger of Kinderhelfer looks really strong and streamlined. But under the surface, we see cracks starting to form. The first issue is money. In March 1942, the Swiss Red Cross Raymond argues that propaganda for donations should be increased and by doing so he's hoping that families will give more money and he basically admits that the, the new Swiss Red Cross Kinderhelfer is struggling to meet the expanding scope of the project with the current levels of donations. In short, the Swiss Red Cross needed money and it needed it fast. At the same time, government officials were receiving regular reports that the international press was praising Switzerland's impressive humanitarian efforts. On the 9th of February, 1942, we start to see, um, this what we start to see, Argentina's La Nation, uh, a, a newspaper reports that Swiss efforts, quote, across borders is worthy of the highest praise. And in these gloomy days, the work of the Swiss humanitarian institutions will keep faith in the destiny of the Christian civilization. But this kind of international attention brought a wave of panic to government officials. What would Nazi Germany think of these reports? Would Switzerland look too sympathetic to those under Nazi rule? And would this make look like Switzerland is interfering in the war? Was Kinderhilfe and this massive child evacuation going to destabilize Switzerland's image of being strictly neutral? So now I'll pass it back to Lisa. Oh, you're still muted. Yes, sorry. Um, we're going to go back to the issue of funding. So in order for the Swiss Federal Council to fund the Kinderhilfe, um, certain parliamentary procedures needed to be followed because they intended to use government money, of course. Um, conveniently, a motion was propositioned by an MP called Ernst Reinhardt, and it was also signed by 50 other MPs. And basically what they said was that they wished that the Swiss government would assist with material or materialistically um, um, the Kinderhilfe. So following the parliamentary procedure, Pile Gola had to respond to this motion and he decided to use the occasion to deliver a speech to also draw attention to the remarkable altruistic efforts of the Kinderhelfer and the Swiss people. He also recognized that it was very important to think about how this speech was then gonna be released to the public and to the world. Because, of course, up until then, the Kinderhilfe had been the product of private charities, but now it was official government business being endorsed within formal, formal government networks. So on 11th of June 1942, Pile Gola delivered his speech to the Swiss Parliament in Bern um, and addressed Motion Reinhardt and the whole speech was given in French. So that Pilegola not only had the Swiss audience in mind, but also a wider audience, in particular Nazi Germany, becomes evident when we look at De Haller's extensive feedback on the speech draft, which contains two very interesting suggestions. So he says that the children of um, that the children should rather be called children of Belgrade than the Serbian children, since it would at once, and I quote here, account for the sensitivities of the occupying nation and avoid offending the Yugoslav government in exile and its allies. Another change he suggested or proposed was that um, a tax passage should be slightly 
altered to avoid suggesting that the SRC's leadership over the Kinterhilfe was imposed by authority, so by the Swiss government. And he tried to thereby re-establish the neutrality of both the Swiss government, but also of the Kinderhilfe. However, we have heard from Chelsea that indeed the Swiss government did control the Kinderhilfe and also its propaganda. And this becomes very clear when we look at the correspondence between, between Raymond from the SRC and between the Haller um, before the speech was actually delivered in Parliament. So Raymond, as Chelsea had explained, was very keen on getting additional funds. So he wanted to release um, propaganda to the people of Switzerland so they would donate more money. However, the Haller told him that this was absolutely out of question and this could even jeopardize what Pilegola actually wanted to achieve with the speech. And then he goes on and he suggests that Raymond should include in the press release or the propaganda release in the following week after the speech sections of the speech. And at this, Raymond is absolutely outraged and he replies the following. I do not agree with your proposition to use extracts of Federal Council Pilegola's speech for our propaganda press release next week. We cannot let ourselves be taken in tow by the government's announcements. We need to preserve the possibility to discuss our problems in the press freely. So this conversation indicates that there was indeed a debate between the Swiss Red Cross and the Swiss Federal Council about how such national humanitarian projects should and could be portrayed within this heated political environment. So now what actually happened to the speech or how was it released? Because multilingualism was already established within the Swiss federal administration at the time, the speech had to be translated into German. And because Pilegola was the head of the political department, the translation would automatically go to the political department. But unlike many other departments within the administration, they did not have a designated translation division most likely because the work was inherently multilingual and all the staff members needed to be able to speak and command several languages anyway. So the task of translating Pilegola's speech was given to a guy called Dr. Ernst Schneider, who was a legal intern at the time within the department. And he was also in the early 1960s um, the high, the UN High Commissioner of Refugees. So he was given um, this task by Pia Bona, the head of the Foreign Affairs Division, who also asked another German speaking jurist called Berlin to assist Schneider, especially with the terminology, but also with contextual information as needed. Now, ensuring terminological consistency and getting translations revised by a second translator, those were established um, policies within the Swiss federal administration. What would, however, appear to be rather unusual is the rank of the third person who got involved in this translation process. And that was Walter Otto Stucki, the Swiss ambassador in Vichy. Um, we learn from the note Berlin sends to the Haller that Stucki indeed altered the translation considerably, considerably and he claimed it didn't render Pilegola's style very well. Now, given Stucki's position and especially his political outlook, one could argue or assume that he wanted to ensure not to offend the receivers of the speech in Nazi Germany. And that seems to what has happened when we look at this translation excerpts that we have here, the French version and the German version. Um, to very quickly contextualize this, um, it's at the beginning of the speech and it basically talks about the difference between 
um, the Swiss Red Cross and the International Red Cross and neutrality a lot. So you see that in the French version, the committee of the Kinderhilfe actively collaborates with national Red Crosses, whereas in the German version, it just collaborates. So it's a little bit le less active in looking for support from non-Swiss people. Um, we also see that in the French version, the committee is entirely composed of Swiss people. In the German version, it's Swiss citizens. And while in the French version, this fact that the committee consists mainly or exclusively of Swiss people is in a way the material condition for the functioning of the Kinderhilfe, in the German version, it's virtually the material condition to do that. So we see that this is a little bit highlighted and overall, the German version seems to emphasize the connection between Swiss neutrality, being Swiss, and the neutrality of humanitarian work. So the concerns about how this speech would be received and its impact on Switzerland's image abroad drew the unusual attention of high-ranking politicians to translate this speech. And just to remind you, it was the ambassador to Vichy, but also the Haller, who had been very curious to know what was happening with that translation. And this highlights the critical importance that translation played in ensuring Switzerland was depicted in the right way. Thanks, Lisa. So despite all of these concerns, which um, there were many, and all of these interferences and all of these random individuals who are not professional translators acting as professional translators in a way, um, despite all these concerns, we have uh, basically Pelagola speech is delivered and it seems to have been received fairly well. Immediately following the speech, Dahala wrote to Pelagola on the 13th of June, 1942, to inform him that the speech had had a very big effect on the Swiss Red Cross. And it was decided that excerpts of the speech would be used in the Swiss Red Cross weekly magazine. Dahala was quick to point out that certain political passages could be removed as the newspaper is distributed throughout Switzerland and, the, and foreign national societies, especially the German Red Cross who receive it regularly. Subsequent documents reveal that Pelago Law wished to remove certain portions of the text from the French source text for the German translation. And in July, these edits were obviously acceptable to all parties because a large portion of the speech was included in the Swiss Red Cross magazine in early August and circulated throughout Switzerland. But throughout the summer of 1942, a few events took place which altered the political stability of Switzerland's humanitarian operations. First, Kinderhilfe continued to receive international praise within the press, including from the British press, such as the news, or sorry, such as the Star and the New Statesman and Nation, and even from the British Mandate of Palestine, including Jerusalem Star. This drew discomfort from the ranks of the Swiss government officials. But why this time, considering the fact that they just allowed the publication within a Swiss Red Cross magazine? two sort of reasons that I can find as a historian here. First is that Swiss officials were concerned about how such praise and positive portrayals would affect not only Switzerland's political neutrality, but also the impartiality of the Swiss Red Cross. Such newspaper articles implied, as we suggested earlier, a sense that German aggression was to blame for the poor state of the children and, by proxy, the Vichy French authorities. If either of these two governments became upset because the Swiss were portrayed as the heroes who saved the children, then it could compromise the delicate neutrality that was at the very core of the Red Cross movement and the Swiss government, and which was required to perform such politically sensitive humanitarian missions. Secondly, events in France were taking a violent turn. In July, French police in northern German-occupied France, essentially Paris, began rounding up Jews for deportation east. This escalated and extended into southern unoccupied Vichy France, 
Swiss Red Cross nurses and doctors sent confidential urgent memos directly to the top of the Swiss government, telling them of the shocking deportations of thousands of Jewish children from various parts of France. The Swiss Red Cross called for immediate action on behalf of these foreign children and hoped desperately that the Swiss federal government would intervene. The deportations of Jews led to heated debates across every segment of Swiss society, including its government, the charities, Swiss citizens, absolutely everybody. But the Swiss chief of police, a guy named Heinrich Rothmund, was adamant that Switzerland should not become a refuge for all those fleeing Nazi persecution. And with Pelagola's consent, Swiss borders were closed to all refugees, including children in, within this Kinderhilfe evacuation in August of 1942. And as you can imagine, this is a very sore point in Swiss history even today. Ironically, the Swiss Red Cross reluctantly understood that it could not afford to politicize the Red Cross. During a meeting on the 4th of September, so just a couple weeks later, the Swiss Red Cross said it found the border closures outrageous, but also recommends caution because of the neutrality that the Red Cross must maintain. Meanwhile, Dahale, Dahala uh, reminded the Swiss Red Cross employees that the Swiss Red Cross is not a private organization and it cannot pursue its policies. It must abide by those of the Federal Council. As instructed by the Swiss federal government, Kinderhilfe's operations were suspended. Evacuations of children did not resume until July 1944, which was, of course, when the, the liberation of Europe happened. After which the Kinderhelfa remarkably evacuated another 100,000 children for three month stays to Switzerland from various countries across Europe all the way until 1949. So what does this all mean? A few obvious things have been mentioned. First, neutrality is often a convenient excuse to not act in the face of grave injustice and violent politics. Even among nations that have a long history of neutrality, like Switzerland, neutrality is still tenuous at the best of times during war. Secondly, we know that humanitarian projects throughout history have regularly been exploited and manipulated by governments and non-state actors to meet certain political requirements. Switzerland was no exception to this. But this moment in history amplifies the role that language plays in humanitarian projects. Even the selection of children on the basis of their linguistic compatibility with Switzerland influence which children would benefit from what kind of humanitarian relief. But as we've also discussed, the use of translation within this child evacuation demonstrates that Swiss officials, including the Swiss Red Cross, believe that they could negotiate the political problems they faced by simply changing how a speech was conveyed to certain audiences in certain languages. Their institutional multilingualism meant that Swiss had to translate official speeches into German, but this was also a liability uh, to, uh, with potential for provoking further negative attention and then possibly also undermining Switzerland's neutral status. But as we've shown today, the Swiss asserted their authority over their official messages by translating them themselves rather than relying on German authorities to translate the, the speeches, for example. This also gave the Swiss the opportunity to modify their translation in a subtle and deliberate way as it allowed them more power to negotiate the politics of wartime Europe. In short, translation was an innovative way to manage crisis, satisfy political demands, and even pacify belligerents while conducting a massive transnational humanitarian evacuation for children. Ultimately, this heightens uh, our knowledge about the strategic importance of language within humanitarian action. And by understanding how multilingualism and translation can support humanitarian projects rather than just politics, I think it allows us a broader range of tools to ensure better practices in multilingual conflict zones in the future. Mm -hmm.